This is the um, Circe Fall 2016, and the theme is the 70s. In this room, we will have um, Iranian Revolution and its representation in American media, followed by Is the Hijab or Veil a Symbol of Oppression? That will be followed by 70s funk music, All That Is Good Is Nasty, American Cinematic Eye for the Slanted Eye Guy, and then finally American Muscle. So I now present Iranian Revolution and its representation in American media. Uh, I'm Matt Mahachek, and my name is Mark Alvarez. And this is our presentation, the Iranian Revolution and its, effect, and its effects on the Western perception of Islam. Uh, so for a little background, I've, I've, a little background information of Iran pre-revolution. Um, before the revolution, it was a very westernized country. Uh, all the dress people wore was very western. Uh, women didn't have any kind of social dress code. Um, many women attended university, and this was all under the reign of uh, Muhammad Reza Shah. So one of the books I found by Hanson Brad was The West Though, Toxification. So in his book, he talks about um, various intellectuals who despised the westernization of Iran. They tried de-westernizing their society by not translating any form of western literature so that Iran would not adopt any western values or customs into Iran. These intellectuals thought their values were far more superior than the, one, than the western ones. So they took matters into their own hands and tried fixing the problem by stopping interaction with the Western media. So, a little bit about the Iranian sentiments of the civil war within its own country. So in this graphic novel I read called Persopolis by Marjane Satrapi, it shows the feelings about the revolution through the lens of a child. Not only did they hate the fact about the revolution taking away their rights, but they feared for their lives and wanted to seek refuge in most cases, they wanted to move to America, but they went to other European countries as well. Many people were imprisoned, such as Marjane Satrapi's, the main character of the Persepolis book. Her uncle was um, in prison for very long periods of time, and they were often tor tortured in prison. <coughs> the main character, Marjane, viewed martyrs as honorable people. This simply means that a child in Iran in the 70s glorified anyone willing to die to the hands of their own countrymen for their nation. <clears throat> so in 1979, November of 1979, uh, the Iranian hostage crisis happened. This was the uh, captivity of 44 US citizens at the US Embassy in Iran. They were held captive for 444 days, and this was all under the uh, Jimmy Carter's presidency. Uh, the uh, people, the perpetrators of this were uh, Palestinian students who, or not Palestinian, I, Islamic students who wanted to, um, who wanted to stop interference of America in Iranian affairs and Iranian uh, governmental policies. <clears throat> Um, the situation had an enormous impact on the public view of Islam in America. Uh, it was a very frightening thing. Um, many Americans tend to view America as sort of this invulnerable type of entity. And this was a real wake-up call that, you know, other countries are willing to step up to us, especially in foreign situations. Um, this was one of the roots of Islamophobia. Uh, with the return of a fundamental Islam-based government system, um, paired with the rapid de-Westernization efforts by the policy makers and the revolutionaries, uh, it was a very frightening thing. Uh, it made Iran you know, have this kind of air of mystery and fear for many Americans, because it's something that they had never experienced before, one that was already openly hostile. Um,
So with the uh, revolution came the return of the veil in uh, Iran. Uh, the veil is also called the hijab. It is a covering of the head and hair of women, and it was now being forced women for women to wear it in social situations. Before this, it had been a choice for uh, those who um, felt that they should for their religious beliefs, and this was a prime example of the de-westernization of the country. Uh, many American women, many British, European women do not do this, even if they are Islamic, and very much so. Um, it created a stark cultural difference, a sense of othering for many Americans and for Iranians. They felt that they were, in fact, inherently different because of um, these cultural changes. And yeah, this is a picture, an example of uh, five women wearing the hijab. Um, the thing about this picture is it's very possible that these five women had no idea what it was like before they had to wear the hijab. This is just life for them now. Um, yeah. So the Shah's reign impact on Western perception. The United States, despite having mixed emotions about Iran, sent out our president at the time, Richard Nixon, which was, this was all pre-revolution still, discuss some business, to discuss some business with the Shah at the moment, Mohammad Reza. So Sid Gary, the author of All Fall Down, America's Tragic Encounter with Iran, states that President Nixon had private meetings with the Shah to discuss agreements on mutually beneficial trades, one of which being Iran protecting the Western interest of the oil in the Persian Gulf. So the United States, in turn, would authorize Iran a look into some of our nuclear, non-nuclear military information. Iran would also allow the United States to have more uniformed advisors working and living in Iran. So this is a picture of the meeting of Richard Nixon and the Shah at the moment. They're also their wives met, but we'll show that in a later picture in one of the videos we created. Here we have a video of uh, many examples of how Western culture Iran really was before the revolution of 1979. As you can see, they have, they're all dressed very Western. Um, they wear lipstick, makeup, all these things that uh, is not customary now. As you can tell, none of them are wearing the veil yet. Uh, women went to the beach in bikinis and uh, revealing clothing, shedding a lot of skin, cleavage. This is actually one of the songs of Feirouz, I believe, which is also an Iranian singer. So as you can see, the country was incredibly Western. Um, I mean, except for skin tone, it could have been pictures of you know, New York City at the time. So how this all relates to the modern views of Islam. Um, for many Americans nowadays, Islam is a frightening thing. Um, of course, a large part of it being due to the attacks of 9-11. Uh, the roots of this fear started back in the 70s. Um, it started with, in the 1974 Olympics with the Palestinians uh, taking hostage of Israeli, uh, the Israeli wrestling team and uh, subsequently killing them in cold blood. Um, and then 
coupling that with the Iranian Revolution and the hostage crisis of 52 Americans for over a year, uh, this really created this, you know, this inherent fear of these, because these people were doing this under the name of Islam, whether or not it's fundamental to the religion, they were doing it in the name of it, and many Americans um, didn't know anything else to think about it. Um, Uh, Islamophobia is, is a very important issue nowadays, especially with President-elect Donald Trump bringing it to the forefront. Um, whether it be the uh, treatment of Islamic people in America now, uh, the immigration of them to the country, or the policies for the religion in and of itself in our country, it's very important that we you know, educate ourselves and uh, do away with Islamophobia, for sure, because it's just, it's toxic to be afraid of an entire group of people because of the actions of a few. Alright, so this is a video we created, a slideshow on iMoving. This represents a, this represents four um, youths at the, they were youth, they were in the University of Tehran, students. And as you can see, they're studying and dressed in very Western culture. Um, this is an example of a model in a magazine, uh, Pre-Revolution. She is uh, clearly showing a lot of skin, um, dressed very Western. Uh, you can see she's showing a lot of body. So the swimsuit was a, a Western thing that the Iranians adopted into their country. And this is just some pre-revolution women. For example, nowadays women wouldn't be, uh, it would not be socially acceptable for them to wear these sorts of things. Uh, these are the six, uh, six of the hostages in the, um, of the Israeli wrestling team in 1974 that were killed. Um, well, six out of the 11. So yeah. this is just a poster, I mean a magazine, I guess, cover of The Sun, which is an American magazine displaying the massacre in Munich in the 1972 Olympics. And it's important to note that this is the kind of thing that Americans were seeing, and this is a big contributor to the Islamophobia. Um, that's pretty much the only view people had of Islam at the time. So this is Richard Nixon when he met up with the Reza Shah. And here's the one waving his hand is Reza Shah's wife, and the one with the yellow is Richard Nixon's wife. These are pictures of the uh, hostage crisis in 1979. This is um, a few of the revolutionaries um, you know, demonstrating outside. This is a picture of the uh, hostages themselves. They were blindfolded, uh, kept in very poor conditions, and all of this just due to the fact that they worked at the U.S. Embassy. <coughs> These are the actual fundamentalist um, hopping over the fence into the embassy. So as you can see, it's pretty frightening scene for Americans, seeing their embassy getting raided by them hopping over the fence. Uh, this is an example of the hijab. Um, you can see uh, it covers the hair, but it does not cover the face. Um, each culture in the Middle East has a different uh, hijab. Um, some of them cover parts of the face, and nowadays a lot of women even make them out of different materials and different patterns just to, you know, kind of make it their own. Um, this is another picture of the five women um, wearing the hijab who, you know, who probably never known what it's like not to wear a hijab in a social a situation. So this is our work site. Uh, yeah, this is our uh, three books we used primarily with the for the presentation. Yes. Do you know the name of the the person?
person right before the shot? Who is the ruler right before the shot? I think it was his dad. Before the shot? Before um, the shot. Yeah, it was uh, shot Pahlavi. P-A-H-L-A-V-I. Oh, okay. He took over in the, late in the 30s, late 30s, early right, 40s, yeah. and ruled like until a, the 60s. A coup or something? Uh, yeah, it was actually uh, perpetrated with the Americans. It was a coup d'etat. Yeah. Yeah, because they were a Western, um, they were pro-Western, and it was important for America at that time to have a pro-Western leader in a large country yeah, like Iran in the Middle East. Yeah, for oil and that's a fun stuff. Yeah. <laughs> Great job. Yeah, thank you. Thank you. So hi everyone, my name is Stephanie Rosas. I'm doing um, this presentation on the veil and women's oppression. And it's going to be kind of a, at first I'm going to give you a little background and then I'm going to go into um, an analysis of women's literature to kind of back up everything that I'm saying. So um, the hijab is also called the veil. Um, it's the name for many different kinds of headscarves traditionally started using by Muslim women. Um, so it would be to like cover the head and the neck area. And this is just different examples of um, some kinds of styles that women would use. So um, I'm starting as, is the hijab a symbol of oppression? So the hijab was forced and banned from many countries and it did show evidence to that it had an effect on women. Um, the hijab is seen as a symbol of oppression in Arab countries because it is forced on women. But my presentation is going to be on whether it's the actual hijab that, you, that is uh, oppressing women or is it the um, controlling of the hijab, the actual culprit. So um, to give you a little background, here's um, some pictures of the Western Middle East, um, different things. So college students in Iran, they wear like they wore like very modern Western dresses, and um, there were like co-eds, and like men and women had the same like they went to the same place of education. So um, women in Egypt walking down the streets in the 1960s. So as you can see, it's very like Western culture, very Western dress. Um, so so historical background in Lebanon. Um, Lebanon was very influenced by the West. They had a ruler that was approved by the West and that um, a lot of the people of Lebanon were against that because they didn't want someone else ruling their country. They didn't want the United States ruling their country. They wanted to be in charge of the country themselves. Um, so this kind of started the 1975 Civil War. It was the Palestine Liberation Army versus the Christian militias. It ended in about um, 250,000 deaths and another 200,000 casualties. And um, a million ended up, a million people ended up just leaving the country altogether because of all the war that was going on. After the war, there was a Lebanese and civil, S Syrian victory, and after this is when women were forced to wear the hijab in social situations. Um, in Iran, kind of the same thing, uh, the Shah embarked on a white revolution. Um, it was very Western, women went to universities. Um, just a lot of social concepts from the West were applied in here too, so you couldn't really see, like there wasn't much of a difference between them. Um, the Iranian Revolution was also caused by discontent of Western influence by the Shah. Um, and it re the revolution placed a leader, um, Ayotollah Khomeini as a leader, and he was very uh, religion based, and that's what he ended up putting on the rest of the country. So. Uh, so the strict laws, the religious laws, were enforced by the Slavic police and included the requirement that women had to cover up. The Slavic police was known for a lot of violence. They enforced all their laws, and if you didn't, like people were afraid to step out because the Slavic police would take you. Um, so I'm going to go into so social and political reasoning why women would want to wear the hijab. Um, so <coughs> social pressure was... Um, Women felt that if they wore the hijab, they weren't able to ward off thugs. They felt um, that they didn't have to be seen as like this symbol of like, just like seen for their own sexuality, they're just seen for their ideas. And a lot of women wanted to wear that and they felt empowered by just seeing being seen for their ideas. But a lot of women wore it because of social pressure and political pressure because they felt as though if they wore the hijab, it was like, okay, we'll do this for you, we'll wear the hijab for you, but 
here are also some political things that we wanted to push, so this is kind of what they would do. Um, so in political reasoning, I read this uh, book called uh, Persepolis, and um, it kind of was uh, the main character in Mary Jane. She was, um, she was forced to wear the hijab. She went to school in a bilingual school, French school, but then after the revolution, the students were separated and the girls had to wear the hijab. Um, it says here, in 1979, a revolution took place. It was later called the Islamic Revolution. Then came 1980, the year it was oblig obligatory to wear the veil at school. And then you can see there, the children didn't really want to wear the veil. The girls were just like, we didn't understand why we had to, they just had to. Um, it says here, um, at the end she goes, she explains about how she was in that school and then that the leader was like, you know what, you guys just have to be separate and wear the veil. And she says, and that was that. So it's just kind of a, another thing of like, women didn't have a choice. It was just, this is what you do and you don't have any say about it. And you also have to realize it wasn't just the veil. It was, you have to be separate for the men. You have to uh, have a different education. You can't be bilingual anymore because that's too Western. And you can't, when you say, okay, men and women have to have different education, you can't guarantee that it's equal. Um, also in Persepolis, there was a scene where her mother went to a protest and there was a picture taken of her and she says that the, her mother was really scared. She started, she dyed her hair blonde and she started wearing sunglasses and she, you can see she's like ducking her head when she goes out. Um, these women who went out to protest for the veil, that they didn't want to wear the veil, they were scared. If like she was out there and so she was scared and that's not being freedom. Freedom is being able to speak your mind and not being afraid that you're going to be like taken to the jail for not wanting to do something. Um, but you could see that there were also um, some women did want to wear the veil because there's an argument between the women who did want to wear the veil and those who didn't. Um, so what happens when the hijab is forced? So women who didn't comply suffered greatly, like I said, some were sentenced to jail, some were sentenced to death, some were stoned to death, some Civilians took them upon themselves to s when the women went out without the veil, and they took it upon themselves to punish them. I would see like um, examples of people that women were stoned to death by their own family members because it was such a shame for them not to be wearing the hijab. Um, in a book called The World Through Arab Eyes, there was a prisoner who ended up killing her rapist, and. Um, she was sent to jail and she was going to be sentenced to death. And this was um, just kind of an, the book was an interview of her life. Um, she took a step from, like, she was quiet all her life because all her life she was abused by her parents, she was abused by her husband, she was abused by her uncles. And she didn't say anything when she finally stepped up and killed a rapist. It's a woman stepping up and she was sentenced to death. Like she they stopped that. Um, in an excerpt from uh, a poem called A Lover Exiled into Freedom, it goes, I would tell you the story of a woman whose wings they tried to clip. In the dark she secretly fled, but from that day she learned to soar, like you from that day. The open space became her prison and freedom her exile. So you could see she was bleeding from what happened. They tried to clip her wings. Forcing a woman to do anything is oppression, and these women are going to try to fight back for their rights. This woman ended up fleeing like the million other people who left Lebanon. Um, but you do have to realize that the hijab um, has its history as a symbol of religion. People wear it to show their uh, religious devotion, to show that they have faith in Islam, and a lot of women feel comfortable because, like, wearing this, like I said earlier, not being seen as a sexual object just for their ideas, and uh, that makes them empowered. So, not all women are forced to wear them, and some women do want to wear it. So, um, the conclusion I came to was kind of what we have been learning this whole time in the 1970s. Is the 1970s was a whole um, era of fighting for what you believe in and coming together. 
um, against oppression, and these women were oppressed because something was forced on them. Forcing women to do anything is oppression. Um, the women were not being um, oppressed by the hijab. It was the people trying to force the hijab on them. And women have the right to be free and have a choice. And I think in anything, we have to learn that we have to accept different views and that we need to be tolerant of others if we want a place that's equal and free. So my name is Thomas Galino, and I'm doing my presentation on funk music in the 1970s for All That Is Good Is Nasty, which is a line from a, a band called Funkadelic that I think kind of embodies uh, funk music in uh, one statement. And I want to start off by uh, discussing kind of what brought about the f um, funk music and what made it so popular. And uh, it starts with the uh, civil rights movement, where um, that movement brought together the whole of the African American community. And there was this euphoria that came with it. They went and they uh, fought for their rights. And they won. They got legislation pla passed. And then uh, America in the 70s, as it was for many groups, didn't kind of turn out how they wanted it to. And funk music um, kind of brought the African American community together again. So I'm going to be uh, focusing on three artists, three artists that uh, showed up the most in my research. And they were uh, James Brown, Parliament Funkadelic, which is the same band, just with two different names, and Earth, Wind, and Fire. So, take this. This is James Brown. So that was James Brown. You can see that um, you hear like the, quang, the twangy kind of rhythmic guitar. It's like a staple of funk music. So James Brown got started in uh, 1956 in a group called the Famous Flames. So he was ahead of his time. And uh, he's looked upon as like the founder, the godfather of, of funk music. And um, he, uh, people initially uh, coined his music uh, just soul, which uh, Consequently, made funk music it, it had a hard time uh, being taken seriously as its own genre because it was considered a kind of a subgenre of soul music. And um, he's known really well for his social activism, mainly for uh, education for use. And kind of a sad story I heard on uh, when I did my research was when he was in the eighth grade, he got kicked out of school because he didn't have enough clothes to wear. And um, so uh, you'd think that an African American in the 1960s would be uh, really active in the uh, social rights movement, but he kind of shied away from politics and uh, social activism. So this next band is uh, P-Funk or Parliament Funkadelic. <laughs> It's George Clinton right there in the furry coat. And uh, this group was started in 1968 by George Clinton, who's uh, really influential and uh, a really no name just in the music industry in general. 
and uh, P funk were were pretty popular in the in the funk music scene. Maybe not so much uh, in the mainstream, but uh, uh, pretty much if you like funk, you like uh, Parliament or Funkadelic. And um, they were really influential, not just for their music, but as you can see from their stage presence and kind of their their stage antics and show. And uh, they were uh, influential to genres ranging from disco all the way to punk. And um, as you can see, they used comically driven material. I was, you were laughing, that's kind of funny. <laughs> it's funny what they're wearing. Yeah. <laughs> okay, and the third band is uh, Earth, Wind, and Fire. Fire is probably the most known group. Uh, pretty much everyone knows about them. They're really successful. And that got started in 1970 in uh, Chicago. And uh, a big group. They had eight other members, kind of like a Funkadelic, big, big groups. And um, they were extremely popular and they're really musically well rounded. They're, uh, they play genres from, you know, soul, R&B, and uh, rock and roll. And uh, they really brought uh, uh, black popular uh, black music. They made it uh, really popular to the masses, and uh, they were so popular that they uh, kind of bridged the gap that was prevalent in uh, the 1970s between white and black music lovers. Uh, and um, you can see funk's music, funk music's influence pretty much everywhere today. Uh, Bruno Mars, uh, all over hip hop, and uh, the Red Hot Chili Peppers. I can, they kind of like ripped off. Funkadelic, in my opinion, in the 80s, but uh, George Clinton actually produced one of their early albums. He was really encouraging of uh, uh, future groups to kind of take and build upon funk music. And uh, if you just like YouTube uh, George Clinton, you'll see him like doing collaborations with Ice Cube or, or Kendrick Lamar. So I have a video now of uh, Snoop Dogg talking about uh, George Clinton to finish up my presentation. Members of here in George Clinton music groups in the 70s, and uh, Knee Deep, and One Nation Under the Road, Aqua Boogie, I remember Sun Knows, I had his poster, the character he created with the long nose and white brown eyes, standing on top of water because he didn't like to swim. And I had that poster in my room because it was so funny, but it was dope. As a kid, I didn't even know what dope was until they were a fresh one, but I knew it was funny and felt good to be listening to Sun Knows. Dr. Frankenstein and all these damn star child, these characters that he created, which eventually made me create my characters because I was so inspired by them. He's influenced me in so many ways. He pro proclaimed me the futurist in Bow Wow, the pick of the world. Me being the Snoop Doggy Dog, the Atomic Dog, the Funk, and just being a pioneer and helping and holding the other people's abilities and talents and helping them. Individuals on their own. Like he did with Prince and Tyler, that fish and I had to go to resistance that played for him. He invited him, you know, to do their own thing. And that's what I've been able to do, to take on that to be a living in studio and do that thing. Kind of approach. Me and George, we love each other. It's always been mutual. He's come to my house many times. We made many records. That's somebody who really gets the second generation, meaning that when hip hop came about, he didn't antagonize, he allowed us to use his music and sample his, you know, his creativity and work for us. And that's what allowed him to stay around because a lot of those artists that were all, you know, disgruntled when they didn't want the hip hop artists to use their 
samples and built up a bad relationship with the hip hop community. And then they basically fell off or died and, and it went bad. And then it just left bad blood. But people like George Stern, James Brown, you know, they stepped to the plate, Roger Travel. They was able to allow us to use their music and say, you know, we don't have no problem. Do your thing. We love each other. I just got you. I just love you for life. That's it. So there's actually some context behind this presentation and why I wanted to do it. So some of the best memories I had when I was younger would be of me and my dad waking up early in the morning and we would just flip on the TV, there'd be some old movies going on. Like there'd be Rocky, Jaws, with the movies and those were some examples. But one genre film that we actually enjoyed a lot was uh, martial arts cinema. My dad liked it for a strict um, attention to detail and the authenticity aspect of it. But Back then, I was just a chubby 10 year old boy, and I just kind of like watching them for the bottom fight scenes. <laughs> and then, fast forward a few years, and you know, it's middle school, I'm getting you know, bullied for things I can't really help. Like, I'm getting called Kung Fu Panda, I'm getting called Dragon Kick or Squinty, those kinds of things. And looking back on that, it gave me inspiration to find this topic. And the more I researched, the more I realized that martial arts films were one of the leading contributors to where these stereotypes had originated from, and that's what I'm going to be arguing in my presentation today. That's better. All right, so the first documentation of a martial artist to give you guys some historical context, it dates back as far as Morning Stage China and back in the Han and Qing dynasties. And you know, every martial artist or every martial arts film has its own different form of uh, protagonist. It's usually some ordinary guy who doesn't really you know, stand out in the crowd very much, and regardless of that, he still manages to fight with people who are oppressed or mistreated in any other way. And the, one of the cool things about martial arts films is that it's not based on a person of influence or a historical figure. Instead of that, it's based on a person who establishes the equality between the body and the mind. And I have a quote up there who say, uh, that says, how martial arts, uh, how martial artists were portrayed in their Men who treated status and more lightly and were not afraid to die. They have flooded authority, were loyal to friends, and helped the poor and press regardless of their own situations. And it was because of this quiet yet virtuous character that a lot of novelists and a lot of filmmakers actually found inspiration for this to integrate into different forms of entertainment. So novelists weren't really sure what to do with this kind of character, so they figured that a romantic approach would be better, you know have the hero find his skills as a fighter progress over time, the more he found, or the more that he realized that there was someone worth fighting for. And that was basically the basic plot line for those kinds of novels. And fast forward to 1927, uh, the Shanghai film industry adopts the process of filmmaking, and they try to picturize these kinds of different romantic novels and try to put them up on the big screen. They had the tools, they had the actors, and they had the script to follow, but there was a lot more to martial arts films than that. So what they wanted to do, they tried to base it off of fictional stories. Um, you can see that that's one of the examples in the middle photo right there. That's um, called, what that guy's wearing is cost, a costume from something called a Peking Opera. It's like a Chinese opera, basically. And you can dance, singing, or there's different mime entertainment things you can do. So that was one of the inspirations for some of the some of the films. And they really wanted to capture the philosophy and they really wanted to capture you know, the full embodiment of martial arts and what that meant to them so that they can look back and kind of reflect on their own work and reflect on their own culture as well while looking at the big screen. There's a movie called The One Art Swordsman which kind of kind of sums up what every martial arts film is usually about, especially in the 1970s, which is to make use of others' perception or of weakness or an ability and turn into strength. So basically, hit them where they're not expecting it. This guy has one arm in the movie, and he's just still beating people up. So that was pretty cool. All right, so before the 70s, people didn't really know much about the Asian culture. They, um, no one really knew much about them. They were seen as like a model minority, one who never talked back, one who never really you know, stood out or was fitted for the hero role in most movies. 
And they're usually cast as demonized villains, they're desexualized, um, amiable or non threatening allies. And I have some pictures from like Disney shows and movies to get a better idea. But then 1973 comes around and martial arts movies are hidden in America because of the well choreographed fight scenes, not only that, but it had kind of an all in the family kind of vibe to it when we went in lecture earlier this year, where like it didn't have the same effect, but it definitely changed the perception in the American theater audience for how the Asian community was meant to be represented. So these are just a few examples of movies that I just picked out and ones that I've actually watched and I really like. If you guys are into martial arts ones at all, I highly recommend one of the four up there. I'm gonna have, I think I have time to show you guys one video. So this is a scene from Enter the Dragon. There's no reason why I picked this uh, specific clip. It's just that you can see it's, I just like it because it looks really cool. You can see like all the choreographed fight moves and they really are paying attention to getting all the angles down, getting basically, I guess, details of martial arts. I'm trying to incorporate that. Turn the sound on, but all you do is just a bunch of screaming and like that. <laughs> <laughs> Stop it right there. So through these different movies, we saw, well, obviously, there was a different representation of the Asian community in these films. And people thought it was really cool, and they wanted to know more about this mysterious culture that they didn't really know very well. They didn't, want to, they didn't even bother getting to know overall. So you have two very influential figures, that's Jackie Chan and Bruce Lee up at the top right there. And the reason why these guys were so well known, the reason why they revolutionized this particular genre of film and the community in general was because they introduced the theme of masculinity and you can see that in the five moves, like the fight scene you just saw just now, you just, just seeing this one guy just take on like 20 or 30 people at a time was just unfathomable to most American audiences during the 1970s. And also look at what they And they were the complete opposite of what you would expect, like, you know, an Asian person to be in film. You know, they were hot headed or impulsive. And because of these two, and as well as many others that I can't really list off the top of my head right now. Um, there, this was the beginning of a transitionary period in martial arts cinema in America. But even though the Shanghai film industry made a lot of effort and made a significant progress in getting their voice heard in uh, the world of cinema, eventually you see in more recent films like this Crouching Tiger and Dragon as an example, they focus more on the star of the film instead of like catching the choreography and small minor details and they're kind of missing the authenticity aspect of martial arts films. And eventually it will just add on more stereotypes for aspiring Asian actors, like they have to be suited for a specific role, or they have to be, you know, I guess look the part, basically. Let's 
So from researching different articles, different biographies, documentaries, autobiographies, like um, all those resources, I was able to come to the conclusion that martial arts films were one of the leading contributors to establishing the Asian American identity for more what it is today, especially in modern cinema. With their strict attention to detail with regards to cultural philosophy, martial arts in general, choreography, and at the same time, it was able to reveal a different side to the culture that no one was expected to see. And I would argue that there's still a lot of stereotypes that are added on after the, stage, uh, after the 70s and that are still seen in film today. But hopefully, martial arts films will go back to how they were back in the 70s when they were thinking. That's all I have. Hello everyone, how's everyone doing? Uh, my name is Daniel Mercado, and today I'll be talking to you guys a little bit about the muscle car era. So what is a muscle car? Car enthusiasts define one as an American coupe vehicle produced between 1964 and 1973. They were big, fast, loud, high-performing cars with their signature eight-cylinder engine. On top of that, the sharp and aggressive body styles introduced during these years made them look so unique and spectacular compared to any other type of car that was previously produced. So these are some examples of like the most iconic from that era. Um, there's a 64 Chevy Impala there on hydraulics, uh, 69 Chevy Camaro Z28 with a 427, 1970 Plymouth Cuda up there, uh, 1968 Dodge Charger RT, and 1967 Ford Mustang GT. Uh, all these cars harness anywhere upwards of 400 horsepower just straight out of the factory, which is insane for that time. Um, here's a little video for you guys. This is just to get, give you guys like an idea of what they were like and what they were capable of. So you guys get the idea. Alright. So people love these cars and they created such a large following. So what ended it all? In 1973, the United States foreign policy showed support for Israel. As America moved forward in a post-industrial, post-World War II world, there became a large dependence on petroleum imports to help fuel everyday life in America. Problems in the Middle East date back for centuries, and OPEC, which is the oil producing and exporting countries, consists mostly of Middle Eastern countries that oppose Israel. So obviously OPEC was not pleased to see the US support Israel and sought to retaliate by placing an oil embargo that would harshly restrict imports to, into the US. Um, this left the country in a sudden panic. There was a fear that everyday life as people knew it was changing out of their control. And as far as the car industry goes, uh, car manufacturers were now forced to produce cars that were simply just like not as cool compared to, <laughs> compared to like you know you, you get stuff like that produced like within a two year span after getting cars like this like it's just it's night and day you know so um, these cars had less power less speed but they're much more efficient because suddenly there was much more focus on vehicle emissions so looking back on it the 1973 oil crisis is looked at as a good thing. It brought focus to vehicle emission regulations, as I just mentioned. It taught the United States in a very crucial time period, as the 70s was, that we had, we had to be really careful when we're depending on other countries for our crucial resources. And it also put a cap on the muscle car era, making those exclusive years so valuable, memorable, and unique. 50 years later, these cars are worth as much as ever, and they only appreciate over time, meaning they only collect in value as they get older. Two examples I have here are this 1970 convertible Cuda up there, which sold for $2,250,000 at Mika Model Auctions, and this 1969 Yanko Chevelle on bottom that sold for $275,000. Here's just two examples, but all across, these boards, all across the board, these cars have increased tenfold and beyond compared to what they were originally priced at when they first came out. Um, the legacy of them has created an entire culture, like car clubs, meetups, conventions, auctions, drag racing, and even restorations, which is where you rebuild the car. 
Owners of these cars know the value they carry, and they pass it on to the next generation of car lovers, just like my dad did for me. My dad owned like a bunch of these cars when he was growing up in this time period, so only naturally his obsession became mine. And this is something my dad and I did, a little project. Um, when I was a senior in high school in, like, the, in 2013, my dad and I started a project to restore this piece of crap, El Camino. Over the next 12 to 14 months, we worked together to rebuild this thing. Every weekend, all weekend, we were out there doing something new, doing something different to the car. It was a long process. Eventually, hard work paid off, and it came out how we envisioned it would. Uh, after we were done, my dad gave me the keys, and now, now she's mine. I wanted to use this as an example of the legacy the car, muscle car era has left on not only me, but car lovers everywhere. Even though my car isn't a classic from the muscle car era, it's an 87, but um, it was still the cars from those years that inspired my dad and I to want to take on this project and make something together that we're both proud of. And at the end of the day, I think that's what it's all about, is taking pride in what's yours and taking pride in what you do. So, yeah, that's it. If you guys have any questions, I'll take some. But that's all I got. Did you say the El Camino? Did you say the El Camino was from 87? Yeah. That, my brother had one from the oh, really? 70s. And yeah. he like tripled his money when he sold it. Yeah, exactly. That's what I was trying to, trying to get across, is that these cars are worth so much more than what they were like compared to back then like obviously inflation has made prices change but even considering that like they've increased exponentially compared to what they were worth when they first came out were they expensive when they first came out no more than like even like a nice one like those like cars that sold for like over two million like that would probably be worth like four or five thousand at the time like, and not even that much compared to today mid, mid range yeah. price yeah. yeah exactly so yeah Thank you. Woo!